For a score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. These, of course, are the opening words of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And this evening on Unfinished Work, we explore Lincoln and Pennsylvania. Starting with my first guest and friend, Brad Hulk, welcome to Channel 20 and to Harrisburg's virtual community circle and town hall meeting, Brad. Good evening, Len Wood. And first of all, I want to congratulate you on your complete body of work. Uh, and we're talking about Lincoln tonight, but I would encourage my friends, especially those who saw our program on the Emancipation Proclamation, to remember the role of Thaddeus Stevens and your two-part book, Thaddeus Stevens in Gettysburg. But tonight, we're going to talk about Lincoln's earliest visits to Pennsylvania. And you were telling me, as we prepared, about his campaign trip, uh, even as early as 1860. Would you share that story with us? In uh, 1860, Abraham Lincoln made a trip east from Springfield, Illinois, to go to New York City to make a speech at the Cooper Institute. Now, he received this invitation in 1859 from a gentleman who was Salmon Chase's campaign manager for the Eastern Party of the United States. And when Lincoln got this invitation, he thought that he was being invited to New York City in order to diminish William Seward's candidacy on behalf of the campaign of Salmon Chase. But Lincoln decided to make that into his campaign tour. And he fashioned his thinking and he fashioned his opportunity with great care. So he researched for weeks and some say even months in the law library of the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois, uh, so that he could present a stunning speech at the Cooper Institute, one which would make him as famous in Republican circles as the Lincoln-Douglas debates had made him. But you said this was a campaign stop, and so in Philadelphia you described that he had to change trains and he decided to scoot across town to meet uh, Cameron. Why Cameron? Cameron was an influential Republican, and he also uh, wanted to meet David Wilmot, who was also an influential Pennsylvania Republican. David Wilmot was the individual of the famous Wilmot Proviso of 1846, which wanted to restrict slavery from the territories that the United States was about to uh, receive in the Mexican-American War. It passed the House once, but never passed again. Wilmot, at that time, had been Republican State Committee Chairman, he also was the uh, platform chairman of the Republican National Convention in 1856. So Lincoln, on his way to New York City through Philadelphia, received cards from Cameron and Wilmot saying that they were at the Girard House, and Lincoln very much wanted to meet those two individuals. He thought that might further his candidacy. And evidently it did. How was his relationship with Mr. Curtin, Governor Curtin? At that point in time, Curtin was the Republican candidate for the governor. And Curtin and Cameron were at odds with each other. So Lincoln actually had to play both camps. Uh, he needed Cameron's support, and he also did not want to offend Ca Curtin either. Now, following the election and before the March inauguration, few people realized that the inauguration was in March at that time, March 4th, I believe. March 4th, yes. He uh, has a grand <clears throat> tour of Pennsylvania on his way to Washington, D.C. And would you describe that day on February 21st, I believe, or 22nd, when he wakes up in Philadelphia, takes the train to Harrisburg, via a whistle stop in Lancaster and then speaks to our elected officials. On Thursday, February the 21st, he arrived in Philadelphia and that evening was told by two separate groups, one Alan Pinkerton's group and another a Washington group that there was an assassination planned for him or an assassination plot 
to be planned in Baltimore for February 23rd. The next morning, Lincoln woke up in Philadelphia, went by carriage to Independence Hall. Inside Independence Hall, he gave an impromptu speech, which is possibly one of his best impromptu speeches, where he says that he had long wondered what kept this nation together for so long. It had to be something in that declaration that gave the hope of liberty, freedom, not only the people of our country, but to the people of the entire world for all future time. And this is a rousing moment in Philadelphia, and yet he <clears throat> stands to speak knowing that there's a conspiracy or a plot against him, correct? Right, and he said in that speech that if the nation could not be preserved on that principle, he would rather be assassinated on that very spot. Oh my goodness. And very few people knew that that was not just an idle boast because very few people knew that he'd been told just the evening before that there was an assassination plot against him. Now that was inside Independence Hall. He then went outside Independence Hall and participated in a flag raising ceremony. From there, he eventually made his way to the West Philadelphia train station, the Pennsylvania <coughs> Railroad, had a four-hour train ride through Lancaster. And he makes that whistle stop in Lancaster? He made a whistle. He hadn't planned on it, but they kind of forced him into stopping. And he was just going to say a few words from the back uh, of the uh, rail car. And they uh, kind of nudged him through the crowd into the Cadwell house. And one of the funny things that I've always uh, thought was that it was noted in the newspapers that the, the welcoming committee in Lancaster had placed beautiful Lancaster women in beautiful gowns along his path. Indeed. In, yes, inside, inside the uh, Cadwell house. So when Lincoln came to the balcony, Lincoln said that he came among them to see and be seen. Now, those were the days when there was no television, there was no radio. That was a line that Lincoln used at, at at least a dozen whistle stops. He liked that line, to see and be seen. And then and, he advances uh, to Harrisburg and to the Capitol to be, see and be seen in that great hall. Tell us about that. Yes, well, he got to, he got to Harrisburg that day uh, around 1.30 p.m. Now, you need to remember that February 22nd is Washington's birthday. Indeed, and there are flags everywhere, the, correct? The flags were everywhere. They, people had come in from as far away as Bethlehem and Philadelphia to march in the parade to observe Washington's birthday. And uh, Lincoln came into town, gave a speech at the Jones House, and then around 2.30 in the afternoon uh, appeared in the uh, House of Representatives chamber to give a speech before the combined General Assembly of Pennsylvania. It was interesting because in that speech, he'd obviously been thinking about his, uh, his visit to Philadelphia that morning. And he said that in the flag raising ceremony, the success of that ceremony, he said he hoped he found an omen of success for the nation. Now, before we bring in our next guest, let's talk a minute about him returning to the Jones house. The mood changes and the uh, departure begins, correct? Correct. He got back to the Jones house, we think, around 4 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, there was a dinner. There was a discussion because the recommendation of Pinkerton and the people from Washington, D.C., was to go through Baltimore secretly at night and so uh, avoid the assassination attempt planned for the next day. And uh, after some debate, because they didn't think it would look too good for the pres president-elect to do this, after some debate, they spirited him out of the Jones house. They took him, Cameron and Ward Hill L L Lehman, uh, in, got into a carriage in front of the Jones house. It was announced that they were going to the executive mansion. Only instead, when the, ca when the carriage got to the executive mansion, they made a detour and went to the edge of the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, and took a single locomotive tender and a single car secretly from uh, Harrisburg into Philadelphia, then from Philadelphia through Baltimore and then into Washington, D.C. This is a good place to bring our next guest in, Matt Pensker, because the, the name Ward Held Lehman turns up in the next very significant visit of Lincoln as he comes to give the Gettysburg Address. Let's invite Matt Pensker to the studio. Good morning. 
We're on the grounds of the Pennsylvania State Capitol in front of a statue that many of you may have passed uh, many times on your journeys, the statue of John Frederick Hartramft. And I'm with Lawrence Keener Farley, a Civil War expert. Good morning. Good morning, Nancy. It's nice to be here. Uh, as you said, many people pass the, uh, the statue every day, and he's just known as the general in the park. And actually, he was one of Pennsylvania's greatest Civil War generals. His name is John Frederick Hartranft, and he came from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And his story in the Civil War begins when Abraham Lincoln calls for volunteers when the war begins. And he calls for volunteers for 90 days. And many people think that he did that because the war was going to be short. Actually, it was because of the law. Congress wasn't in session, so the law said that the president could only call the state militia out for 90 days. So the initial uh, volunteers come in, and Colonel Hartranft, who uh, was a militia officer, brings his regiment here to Pennsylvania, up to the, uh, the Capitol building, and offers the services to Governor Curtin. And it's accepted, and they are named the 4th Regiment of Pennsylvania Infantry to go off and fight. Now the date is April the 20th, so their expiration date is going to be July the 20th. Well, it turns out that's the day that the first Battle of Bull Run is going to be fought. And as the troops are marching out onto the field to fight this first big battle of the Civil War, his men come to him and say, our enlistment has expired. And they walk off the field. And Colonel Hartranft, however, is uh, rather patriotic. He stays on the field uh, as a volunteer and he serves as a messenger. And when the Union Army is routed, he helps to uh, get the troops together to form a defense as they're retreating. And uh, 25 years later, he will be awarded the Medal of Honor for that. So that begins his Civil War career. Uh, during the summer, the Congress comes into session, gives Lincoln the authority to raise three-year regiments. And so Colonel Re Hartranft raises a regiment of men who will serve for three years, and he will lead them through uh, much of the war. And one of the most distinguished things that he will do that he's most well known for is at the Battle of Antietam, he will lead his regiment, which is the 51st Regiment of Pennsylvania Infantry, across what is now called Burnside's Bridge. And that will be one of the things that helps break the Confederates at Antietam and give the North the victory there. That will then allow Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I understand he was involved in the uh, trial of the conspirators to assassinate President Lincoln. Can you talk about that? Yes, uh, after the war uh, he was appointed the Provo Marshal of the District of Columbia and basically that's the uh, chief uh, military police officer and so he was responsible for uh, the uh, holding the prisoners at the uh, old Capitol prison in what is now Fort McNair down in uh, Washington DC and one of the prisoners of course was Mary Surratt the first woman to be charged uh, uh, for a capital crime by the federal government and of course eventually she'll be hung and he was often commended for the, his kindness to her because no one had really ever had to deal with a woman on death row before. Uh, he'll be at the trial, he'll be responsible for the security of the prisoners and then when four of them are convicted and uh, to be executed uh, he'll be the man in charge of the execution and uh, in the family collection they actually have four pieces of rope, one from each of the uh, four nooses that was used to hang uh, the, uh, the four conspirators. That's very interesting. Well, did he continue to serve uh, the Commonwealth after the um, Civil War ended? Yes, after the war, uh, just after the war, he would be elected Auditor General of Pennsylvania for two years. And then after that, he would be elected Governor of Pennsylvania for two years. And one of the things that he was very interested in doing was getting the National Guard started because he had seen the problems at the beginning of the war. So he is often known as the father of the Pennsylvania National Guard. Okay, and the statue behind us, when was that erected? Uh, that was put up in 1899, and its original position was at the front door of the old Capitol building. Mm -hmm. uh, he was considered a major hero back then, and so they really wanted to honor him, so they gave him that very prominent position right at the front door of the Capitol building. Uh, the statue was sculpted by a New York sculptor by the name of Frederick uh, Ruckstall and he has uh, sculptures uh, all over the country including some in Statuary Hall down in the Capitol building in Washington DC. How was it commissioned? 
Uh, it was actually commissioned by the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Uh, they were that impressed by uh, uh, Hart Raft that they actually put up $18,000 to have this uh, statue uh, sculpted and cast. Uh, and it's actually one and a half uh, life size. Uh, so he's uh, bigger than life. Yes, and if you're going to look at something that's that much higher, that's the way it's done. Very definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us. You're very can welcome, you Nancy. give us more information about how people can find out more about the Civil War? Well, they can visit the Camp Curtain uh, website, which is www.campcurtain.org, and on there we have a very nice article about uh, John Frederick Hartranft. And it was written by the author uh, of a book, uh, Albert Gambone. Uh, John Frederick Hartranft, uh, citizen, soldier, and Pennsylvania statesman. And he did a somewhat shorter article that you can find online, or of course you can buy the uh, book that he had published. And, and another book uh, that uh, one of our Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission historians wrote, Richard Saylor, is uh, Soldiers to Governors, uh, stories of various uh, Pennsylvanians who served in the Civil War and then became governor of the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. Now back to you, Leonard. From Dickinson College to the Gettysburg Foundation, from the Lincoln Foundation to some of the great conferences and halls and seminars across the country, we all know and often quote from the writings of Matt Pinsker, who is our guest who has joined us today. Matt, we've been talking about how casual the security for the president was at the beginning of his uh, inauguration and of his administration. And it brings to mind your stories and writings about the, uh, his time in his summer temporary home. Would you, would you talk about that? Sure. Look, despite uh, the story that Brad told about the you know, uh, fears of assassination and the plot in Baltimore, they didn't uh, really apply any kind of presidential security in the first year of the war. The, to the president. They didn't have a bodyguard. There was no secret service. Uh, but eventually, by the second year of the war, uh, they came to realize that there was a threat uh, from the Confederates or from secessionists in Washington. And so they began to start to deploy cavalry units or infantry soldiers to try to protect the president and his family. In fact, the, the bodyguard of the president, as they called them, was uh, an infantry company from uh, northwestern Pennsylvania, Company K of the 150th Pennsylvania, and they were sent to guard the president. Uh, now, I understand we always mix up the soldier's rest and the soldier's home. That's right. The soldiers mix it up too, correct? Sure. When soldiers arrived in Washington in order to defend the Capitol or to be sent forward into the Southern Theater, uh, they went to a soldier's rest. It was a place where they were sort of uh, refreshed, uh, fed, and treated well. Uh, the soldier's home was a place for wounded, retired veterans of the Army. And it was also a place that had about 300 acres of space during the Civil War, about three and a half miles from the White House, and it was used as a kind of Camp David of the 19th century. Uh -huh. So among the wounded soldiers, presidents in the 19th century would have cottages where they would stay in the summer. James Buchanan from Pennsylvania was the first to do this, and Lincoln was the second. And the soldiers from Pennsylvania who were sent as his bodyguard went out in the fall of 1862 to guard him at a cottage around the soldier's home during the period when the Confederates were invading Maryland as part of the Antietam campaign in the fall of 62. Now there was another famous guest who had a cottage on that, uh, the American writer Walt Whitman. Could you? Tell us about his time there. Well, Walt Whitman did not have a cottage on the grounds of the soldier's home, but he lived in Washington during the Civil War, and he lived near the route that Lincoln used as he commuted back and forth between the White House and the soldier's home. The President of the United States used to be a commuter. Uh, during about a quarter of Lincoln's presidency, he didn't live in the White House. He and his family lived out at the soldier's home. This would usually happen between June and November of every season from 62 to 64. And during that period of time, most of that period of time, Walt Whitman lived in Washington, worked as a government bureaucrat, and then also as a volunteer at the local war hospitals. And he would write in his journals and report to the newspapers about his experiences watching the president and his wife in their carriage. Just strolling by or walking by. Now, yeah. you told us through your writing and have, have shared with us this evening the importance 
of the restoration of the soldiers' home. You say that it was one of the most significant intradisciplinary projects. Right. You know, this is a place, like I said, it was the Camp David of the 19th century. Lincoln and his family loved it. They lived there. And yet, for nearly 150 years after their experience there, it was still a functioning part of this retirement community, which still exists today. It's a retirement community for Armed Forces veterans. But about 10 years ago now, uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, the uh, nation began a process of declaring this area the cottage where the president stayed a national monument. And then the National Trust for Historic Preservation began an effort to restore it back to its appearance during the Civil War era. And now, for the last five years, it's been open to the public. And I, I called it an intradisciplinary experience because there are different types of historians who were involved in that process. Uh, there were archivists, there were reenactors, there were academic historians like me, and then there were preservationists like the folks who worked at the National Trust, all of them contributing to this effort. And this is an important part of the series. We have been blessed to have so many different types of historians approaching the interpretation of the 150th. Some names keep reappearing, Matt. Mr. A a Pinkerton is at several of these engagements, as is Ward Lannan. Could you talk about the Pinkerton security guard with Lincoln? And as you do, talk about his trip to Gettysburg in 1863. Right. So Alan Pinkerton was an immigrant from Scotland who arrives in the United States in the 1850s and establishes basically the nation's first detective agency, uh, mostly working as private security for the railroads in Illinois, based out of Chicago. That's how he got the job uh, helping protect the president-elect when he went to Washington in 1861. But he wasn't Lincoln's bodyguard after that. After the president arrived in the Capitol in 1861, Pinkerton became an intelligence operative working for George McClellan in the Army of the Potomac. And he was so bad at that that he had no more experience working for President Lincoln. Lincoln. Um, was more inclined to rely on his old friend, a lawyer, Ward Hill Lehman, like you said, uh, who had known Lincoln for years in Illinois and served as Provost Marshal in the District of Columbia. And it was Lehman who came with Lincoln to Gettysburg and helped organize security, or at least ceremonial security, for the presidential trip here in 63. Gentlemen, Lehman is, what, the, the master of ceremonies of the, uh, of the event, or uh, a, a principal MC of the evening or Brad how would you role? how would you describe how would you describe his role his official title was chief parade marshal chief parade marshal that's and, what I was reaching for but he was also master of ceremonies at the cemetery dedication ceremony let's talk about that dedication ceremony for a, a moment Matt and I'd like to talk about the Gettysburg address from three different angles very quickly the first as a literary achievement, the second as a political speech, you know, and uh, in relationship to who the primary speecher, speaker was supposed to be that day, and the third of uh, some notions of why it has such lasting in, in, endurance. First, talk about it uh, structurally, Matt, if you will, from a literary. We know that Everett, <laughs> Everett was the original keynote speaker gentleman that was invited? So Edward Everett is the keynote speaker from beginning to end. Nobody expected Abraham Lincoln to deliver a, a two-hour oration like Everett did. Uh, Lincoln is there to help dedicate this, this cemetery. Uh, he's, he's to offer a few appropriate remarks, as they say. Uh, now the literary effort of those few appropriate remarks, I think they help explain Lincoln's greatness as a writer. They're evocative. He was brilliant at playing on people's deepest emotions, their core beliefs. He understood how to use the language and rhythm of the King James Bible, of great American political speeches. You know, that phrase that closes the Gettysburg Address, government uh, of the people, by the people, for the people, that's not original to Lincoln. He's paraphrasing great American speakers like Daniel Webster, who said that in his famous speech from 1830 called the Second Reply to Hayne. Daniel Webster, wow. that senator from Massachusetts, so That's, he's invoking great literature. He's, invo he's evoking elements of the American past that people knew well. We don't have footnotes to that address, 
But the people who read it, the people who heard it, they understood what he was trying to do. So he says the, the world will re little remember what happened here. Obviously, we remember it quite well. Why do you think it has such an impact uh, and uh, it's such a signature moment in not only in the war, but in our American memory? So, you know, he, he reminds everybody at the time they have unfinished work and that they need to resolve to complete the task of the men who died in, at Gettysburg. Uh, but since they did complete that task, that's the reason we remember the speech. It, it becomes for us kind of like a creed. It's, it's like the, the trinity of the American civil religion. He, he emphasizes individualism, but he also emphasizes nationalism. He shows how the two are intertwined, and they, they're intertwined by what you might call republicanism or this belief in representative self-government. That's government of the people, by the people, for the people. So when Lincoln takes these three values, individualism, nationalism, and republicanism, and ties them together in that prose poem, that's a way for Americans to remember what they care about. Prose poem. What an interesting comment to make, Matt. We're going to pick up there when we bring our next guest, Dr. Michael Barton, back to our set right after this break. And welcome back to Unfinished Work. Tonight we're talking about Lincoln in Pennsylvania. We've just been joined by Dr. Michael Barton of the Penn State Harrisburg campus and the Historic Society of Dolphin County. Michael, we've been talking about this notion of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as being a prose poem. Matt, would you uh, ex expand on that for a moment? Well, Lincoln was not trying to be an orator, like I said. He wasn't supposed to be the, the main speaker of the day. But what he was trying to do in a handful of appropriate remarks was uh, capture the, the spirit of the war and its meaning at a moment when people were looking ahead to the next presidential election. Now, Michael, Brad Hoke also shared with us the 1861 visit uh, and you brought a, a first-hand report. Uh, would you share that with us? We have an eyewitness account of uh, Lincoln and Harrisburg at that time, uh, over and above the newspapers, and it's contained in the diary of Charles Rawn. Charles Rawn was a Harrisburg attorney, mainly a defense attorney. He'd uh, done his training in Harrisburg under one of the governors and, and continued his practice there from 1830 to 1865, kept a diary for 35 years. We are slowly transcribing this at the Historical Society of Dauphin County. I uh, say to people that each time we transcribe a passage, it's a bit like opening Christmas presents to find out what's there each time. So it's Christmas Day, share something. Yes, well here's what he writes on uh, February 22nd, 1861. Uh, clear, fine beyond expectation, calm, streets in reasonably good walking order, not cold, though dampish and chilly, but take it for all in and all an unusually suitable day for the public ceremonies of raising a flag at the dome of the Capitol, receiving Mr. Lincoln, President-elect of the United States. There are some 1,500 to 2,000 volunteers here from all parts of the state, 400 to 600 of them from Philadelphia. The line was formed at 10 to 11 a.m. and marched to the Capitol at 11.30, where the ceremony of raising the flag was performed, then returned and met Mr. Lincoln on his arrival from Philadelphia in the carriage at about 1.40 p.m. He rode in a barouche drawn by six white horses to Coverly's Hotel, where he was addressed by Governor Curtin. The enthusiasm of the people was perfectly and literally wild and unrestrainable. Our balcony being adjacent to the hotel was crowded with our friends and acquaintances through the day till 5.30 p.m. We got no dinner but took supper at 5.30 to 6 in the morning when the procession went to the Capitol, etc. He goes on. 
uh, the number here in the time of the buckshot wars was approached nearly perhaps to the number here yesterday. Mr. Lincoln's appearance is younger considerably than was generally expected, and he is not so tall nor so raw-boned as we had been given to believe from his pictures and what we had read. He left at six in the evening for Washington, it seems, though this was not known to the public at the time, nor till next tomorrow. He dined at Coverley's private apartments next door to us at 4.30 to 5. We spent evening at home and went to bed at 9 p.m. So that's Charles Ron telling what he saw of Lincoln that day. And we talked about the train ride uh, via Baltimore uh, to Washington, D.C. We talked again about his train ride uh, to ha uh, Gettysburg via Hanover Junction. Brad, I'm going to ask you if you'll share with us quickly. He was supposed to meet Governor Curtin at Hanover Junction and the turnaround? He, he was, but Curtin's train from Harrisburg had mechanical difficulties and it never showed up. So Lincoln eventually went on to Gettysburg. Curtin's train eventually pulled into Gettysburg around midnight that night. And uh, we know that Lincoln has another train ride to uh, Harrisburg, and this is his funeral train. Michael, would you talk about the funeral train? This is uh, Charles Ron observing what I think many people in central Pennsylvania may not realize, that Lincoln's body came here and that it lay in state at the Capitol and then went on from there. Uh, Ron says at that time, on April 15th, um, Saturday the 7th of the week, clear, fine, fresh, called on Dr. Taylor, the president of the school, after breakfast and received the news there through a gentleman communicating to Dr. Taylor in front of his door just as we were starting away together that the president had been basely assassinated at the theater at Washington by shooting last evening. The appalling intelligence threw a deep gloom over all. It was about nine o'clock the said news was thus communicated to Dr. Taylor in my presence by a young gentleman of his acquaintance. Then the next day, April 16th, Sunday, the first day of the week, clear, fine, etc. Um, we all of our house went to what is called the Old South Church Congregationalist at 1030. The Reverend Mr. Smith, preacher, Mr. Brommel, wife and daughter, and a young man from Reading, a boarder and a pupil named Jameson from Company, Calvin and myself, Calvin his son. We sat in Mr. B's pew church, draped in mourning and services appropriate to the occasion of the President's death. We dined at 12.30 and spent afternoon chiefly at quarters and wrote to mother. I walked in all before and after tea three to four miles but didn't seem to derive much benefit from the exercise. And then he talks later uh, about the president's body coming through here uh, and talks about his own health doesn't feel well. The body of President Lincoln arrived here under heavy escort at 8 p.m. This is on April 21st to remain until tomorrow and to be um, um, excuse me, we lose the diary there for a second. Um, but that's his let, let me Let me ask you, gentlemen, what was the impact on central Pennsylvania of the death of Lincoln? And what was the viewing of his body like here in Harrisburg? Brad, would you, would you respond first? I think that the public outpouring uh, along the train route was amazing, especially at whistle stops water stops. Uh, they said it seemed like the train had to plow through the onlookers. People were crying, their heads were uncovered, uh, they were sad, they were angry. In Harrisburg, it was estimated that in five and a half hours of public viewing, that 25,000 people walked by Lincoln's casket when it was in the Capitol building. Matt, who stood watch for him? Was there a special contingent? Well, or? Before I answer that question, I want to say that uh, at Ford's Theater, they, they claim to estimate, roughly, that one out of three Americans who lived in the North viewed some part of the funeral procession during those two weeks that it took to travel from Washington to Springfield. That's almost 2,000 miles. Uh, I, I can't believe that number is correct, but it I think it, it demonstrates what Brad and, and Michael were just talking about. The outpouring of grief um, was extraordinary. 
And Michael, do you have another? Well, he says here, solemn, solemn scene in Harrisburg when Lincoln's body is here. But then says Ron, God makes and directs, and this solemn death is part of his mysterious ways past our finding out. We bow in strong faith. And then on uh, April 22nd, he said, great crowd and great arrangements in reference to the president's remains. They lie at the Capitol, were to be seen last night up to midnight and this morning from 7 to 9 and by others to 10 a.m. An extremely large procession, military and civic, conducted the remains from the Capitol between 10 and 11.30 to the depot where they were embarked for Philadelphia about noon. I was not out except on our veranda as it was somewhat blustery and I was not very wall. Mrs. Ron and Self went in the afternoon to the Capitol to look at the draping of the hall of the House of the Representatives where he lay. We returned home about four. So again, he's, he's telling us, I think, of his own personal involvement, his own personal observations, and then at the other citizens of Harrisburg who are so deeply affected by this. We'll pause there and take a break, but when we come back, I want to ask our three guests what they think the Lincoln legacy is. And why is the Gettysburg Address important and, and why does it have currency to the condition of America today? We're going to take that question up when we come back. We're here in the offices of Robert Philbin, Chief Administrative Officer for the city of Harrisburg. And Bob, we've come to the end of our series. These represent some of the books that we discussed. And look at all the knowledge we have learned in this four episodes. Vast uh, experience. Uh, for our, our viewers. Thank you for your encouragement of the series. Bob Lincoln, despite the war, strife, division, and economic uh, challenges, was able to see new light and new vision and create uh, in that period. And you, you and the mayor have given us the opportunity to create this series. We thank you. We are in your debt. Well, I uh, certainly appreciate that. And may, on behalf of Mayor Thompson, uh, I want to thank you for uh, the, the great work that you've done as a historian and writer and producer of this program. You know, this is, this is a historic moment for the city of Harrisburg uh, under the uh, mayoral leadership of uh, Linda Thompson, who is the first, as we all know, African-American female to uh, be elected to mayor of the city of Harrisburg. So it's historic in the sense that this is the sesquicentennial of the, the Civil War. It's historic in the sense of the knowledge and the unique point of view that the program has been able uh, to present and it's historic in the sense that this whole project was, uh, was developed and uh, led by Mayor Thompson during uh, her administration. And Bob, the mayor is not only an enabler of this series, but she is a descendant of a United States Colored Troop soldier, Lloyd Watts, her great, great, great grandfather, fought in the Civil War. He is buried at Lincoln Cemetery in Gettysburg. So she has a personal connection to this history. We're standing in front of the picture of the United States Colored Troop Grand Review. We understand that Harrisburg was the only city in the United States to honor the 180,000 men who served during the Civil War. And we invite our viewers to stay with the story. We are not at the end of Civil War 150. We're at the zenith point, and the next story is that service of Harrisburg's black men and women in the USCT. So perhaps we'll come back and talk about the USCT in subsequent series. Robert, thank you very much. Again, thank you, and you're quite welcome. It's been a real pleasure uh, being involved with uh, all the creative uh, people and historians who've uh, been able to put this uh, program together. I think it's, uh, it's wonderful for the uh, citizens of Harrisburg to have a point of view uh, in, an, and a, a window into the Civil War experience that uh, they can relate to in their, in their own everyday lives. We thank you for everything that you've done for the city of Harrisburg. Welcome back to our final episode of Unfinished Work and the final block for this evening on Lincoln in Pennsylvania. And I've been asking our guests, Brad Hulk, Matt Pinsker, and Dr. Michael Barton, about the importance of the Gettysburg Address, the Lincoln legacy. So gentlemen, why do we resound to the words? Why do we remember them? Why is the Gettysburg Address important? What currency does it have? And what meaning does it have in relationship, Matt and Michael, to the things that are on the front page 
of the newspaper today that impact our lives. Brad, would you start? Enduring literature somehow engages our hearts and our minds fashion a response. Edward Everett at Gettysburg talked about battle. Abraham Lincoln talked about liberty, freedom, dedication, duty, concentration. By elevating his remarks, Lincoln empowered his generation and future generations to consider his words and apply them to their current lives. Lincoln's speech is heard by individuals of different generations in different ways. In his own generation, they heard about why it was important to win the war, why it was important to continue fighting, what really was at stake, and they understood that. With time, a different generation heard Lincoln's words in a different way, and they heard words of reconciliation and reunification of the nation. Lincoln's words became words for the entire nation. Now, Matt, my question is like your students when I go, ooh, 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 you've just uh, quickened my curiosity. But perhaps you could frame them, so many questions into a statement. Well, in so many ways, the challenges of our era have echoes to the challenges of the Civil War era. You know, it's, it's a much different conflict today. You know, the, the, the polarization of today that we all complain about isn't the same as battlefields. But nonetheless, a lot of the same issues that drove them apart continue to bother us, and some of the issues that drive us apart uh, were born in the aftermath of that unfinished work from their generation. And that's why Lincoln is so relevant today. Thank you. And Michael, like Matt, you touch students and teach them every day. How do you connect the currency and the importance of Civil War 150 to the issues that your students are facing today? How do you capture their imagination? I remind them of what Senator Everett Dirksen used to say, that each generation needs to get right with Lincoln. Mm. Uh, and uh, in a sense, to read his words again, to realize that life again. Although I think there's a distance between us and Lincoln now that we may never bridge. Uh, the man has been virtually deified. I can't even watch the film without treating him as a kind of spiritual character on the screen. Uh, and I think if we get carried away, he can seem above and beyond us and perfect more than we'd ever be. But I think we need to realize that the man is a politician, he is a speaker, he's uh, a deal maker, uh, that he's a military leader, uh, that he is a human being after all. And if we can imagine uh, what Lincoln did and what it cost him and the change in his appearance over the course of the war, then maybe we can get down and say, uh, Lincoln is instructive for us. He does show us that we can be uh, better than we are, that as he grew in his attitude about slavery and the war and the meaning of it all, uh, we can grow too. So I think there are lessons in Lincoln's life, even though, as I said, we, uh, uh, we deify the fellow, uh, and part of that is probably justified. Lincoln University, yes. Lincoln Highway, five Lincoln cemeteries across Pennsylvania. I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska. Link Matt, a student of mine that we took to Gettysburg said, that man Lincoln has his name on everything. Tell us why young folks should participate in Civil War 150. Well, Lincoln is, um, has become the central figure in American history. You know, he, he saved the country and he, he freed the slaves. And he did it with a series of speeches that, as Brad said, have uh, kind of enduring qualities for, for today's world because they're abstract and not specific to the period. And so, you know, anybody who cares about promoting freedom or equality or protecting the nation, they can use Lincoln's words and example to inspire themselves. That's anyone who's looking for inspiration can find uh, 
these words as a lens to seeing it? I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Brad, that young student was on our, her way to see your new seminary museum. Would you tell us about the seminary museum? Yes, I think every American should see the Seminary Ridge Museum in Gettysburg. It's on the seminary campus. It's the newest uh, in uh, Gettysburg. It is quite a bit different from other museums. Uh, it's 20,000 feet of exhibition and text information. The fourth floor is an interpretive center of the uh, first day of battle, we have come to stay. The third floor is an interpretive center of the Civil War field hospital that was there, steeped in sorrow and in death. And the second floor is an interpretive center of religion and its effect on dividing the nation pre-Civil War and on bringing it back together post-Civil War. This post is a wonderful War. place for visual literacy, for learning about the war. Michael, we know that the historic Society of Dolphin County, of which you got some of this information, is a repository of artifacts, letters, and memorabilia. How can our viewers use the collection and the Cameron House to expand their appreciation for and understanding of the war? Well, of course, the mansion is Simon Cameron's residence uh, after he was finished being Lincoln Secretary of War and Minister to Russia. So I think that's an excellent example, although it's a mixed uh, architectural style, but it's a good example of what mid-19th century architecture would have looked like at that time. We've tried to preserve and save as much as we can, uh, and we have some interesting Civil War materials there. We have a, a, a release uh, signed by Lincoln. I don't think it's a stamped signature there, but a, a soldier's commission that's signed by Lincoln. And we have some other materials. I remember there's a poster there uh, that calls for people to chase down his assassin uh, and that there's a reward offered. Uh, and but Matt, the, uh, the visual literate uh, constituency of the 21st century can visit via your House Divided website. Will you tell us about that? Sure, look, nothing beats going to places, right? If you can go to Seminary Ridge Museum, you should. If you can go to the Dauphin County Historical Society, you should. But if you can't, websites are uh, an often a good substitute. So what we've created at the House Divided Project at Dickinson is a web platform, especially for K through 12 teachers, that allows people to see and read the documents and images of the period online and to teach them in ways that make them more accessible. Unfortunately, that is where we will have to end both the series and the evening. I'd like to thank Dr. Michael Barton, Matt Pinsker and Brad Holt, thank you so much for watching this series. Watch it again and again and again with your friends. Until we meet again on the crossroads of time and technology, I'm Linwood Sloan for the city of Harrisburg. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He is loose the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Oh.